You have a supernatural vision of the future that helps you and your coworkers avoid a fatal bridge collapse. But death does not like to be cheated, and the survivors of the tragedy are being killed one by one by death itself. I'm going to explain how you could beat death if you were in the movie by breaking down the story, the mistakes made, and what you should do to beat death in Final Destination 5. Before we start the video, I just need like 15 seconds to quickly advertise to you. Subscribe to Showsplanation so you don't miss future breakdowns of your favorite shows. We have a Patreon in the description that you can donate to to support this YouTube channel. Don't forget to visit MeBomber.com for cool and funny clothing. The website MeBomber.com is in the description. Alright, back to the video. The movie begins with the main characters boarding a bus for a company retreat. The bus crosses a bridge that is having construction work done. Sam has a weird feeling something is wrong. Sam cuts his finger on something sharp in the seat in front of him where his hand was resting. Suddenly there is static on the TV in the bus. Randomly the radio on the bus changes by itself from reading the weather to playing a folk song with lyrics that say, Dust in the wind, all we are is dust in the wind. Then the bridge is hit with a strong gust of wind. The bridge starts to crack. Suspension cables snap. The bridge collapses. Everybody rushes out the bus. The ground crumbles under Candace, who falls and is impaled by the mast of a sailboat. Isaac was on the phone in the bathroom and has no clue what's going on. The bus falls into the water head first, with Isaac stuck on the front window. Olivia falls off the bridge while trying to cross a beam. Then a car rolls off the bridge and crushes her. Nathan is decapitated by a swinging suspension cable. Dennis is hanging on the side of the bridge when he is killed by hot tar pouring on him. Him. Peter and Sam are hanging on the bridge railing. Peter is impaled by metal poles that fell off a construction truck. Sam gets his body cut in half by sheet metal that fell off the same truck. Alright, let me explain how you can survive. Immediately look for an empty area of water to the side of the bridge that is free of debris. Jump off the side of the bridge into that empty area of water. Then quickly swim to the side until you are no longer near the bridge and anything that can fall off it. The mistake the characters made was trying to outrun the collapsing bridge and make it to the end that was still stable, thus exposing themselves to being hit impaled or crushed by the countless objects on and below the bridge. Turns out this was all just a vision of the future that Sam had, and he snaps back to reality. Then events on the bus happen exactly like in his vision. Sam thinks this can't just be a coincidence. Sam yells at everybody on the bus to run off the bridge because it's going to collapse. Everybody thinks Sam is acting crazy. Sam convinces his girlfriend Molly to leave with him. Some co-workers get out the vehicle to chase after or yell at Sam to get back on the bus. The bridge starts crumbling just like in Sam's dream. Sam Sam and seven of his co-workers manage to escape the bridge just in time. Sam is interrogated by Jim, a FBI agent who does not believe his supernatural explanation for predicting the future. The eight employees that survived are at a memorial service for the 17 that died at the bridge. Some co-workers express their suspicion of Sam's supernatural explanation for predicting the future. The memorial service ends and a random guy named William tells Sam and Peter that death does not like to be cheated. They should be careful because death is coming for them. Peter thinks William is just a random weird Weirdo, but Sam experienced something supernatural and takes what William says to heart. Candace, who is a bridge survivor, is also a college student and a gymnast. She's practicing her bar routine. Another gymnast is practicing her balance beam routine, falls off and knocks over a container of gym chalk. The chalk is knocked into a fan which blows into Candace's face as she is swinging on the gymnastics bar. This causes Candace to fly off the horizontal bar and land face first onto her spine, which kills her instantly. There's no advice I can give you to beat this death. Loosening your grip while swinging is a natural human reaction when you are unexpectedly assaulted by a cloud of chalk, and simply not doing so is easier said than done. Sam visits Peter at the hospital who is mourning his girlfriend Candace's death. Sam is weirded out when he sees the same random creepy black guy from the memorial service now at the hospital. Another bridge survivor named Isaac goes to a Chinese spa for an acupuncture session. The therapist leaves the room and instructs Isaac to sleep for 30 minutes with the acupuncture needles in him. A candle wick falls off and sets fire to a towel. Isaac yells for someone to come put out the fire. He accidentally falls off the acupuncture table and is unconscious on the ground. Isaac falling on the ground causes a bottle of rubbing alcohol to spill on the floor. Isaac wakes up and gets on his feet. The acupuncture needles have been pushed deep into his body because of the fall. Isaac is in great pain as he tries to pull an acupuncture needle out of his body. Isaac heads to the door but stops when he hears his cell phone start ringing. The vibrating cell phone knocks over a candle, which sets the spilled alcohol on the floor on fire. Isaac jumps back from the fire and bumps into a wall. Isaac panics on the ground and stares at the oncoming flames, then is relieved as the fire begins to die off.
die off. A metal Buddha statue falls off the shelf on the wall and crushes Isaac's head. Let me explain how you can survive. It just takes 30 seconds for a manageable fire to turn into something that is dangerous and fast moving. Synthetic materials, wood, wall hangings, and countless other factors in a room can accelerate the spread of a fire, resulting in even less time to stop it before it spreads beyond being manageable. After one minute, smoke, which is the largest cause of fire-related deaths, begins to fill a room, spreading as rapidly as the flames. It takes on average five minutes minutes for an entire home to become completely engulfed in flames. A commercial building can take a little longer due to their size. Isaac made the mistake of not respecting how quickly a manageable fire can turn deadly, so much so that he prioritized continuing his acupuncture session and chose to just yell for an employee to come put the fire out so he didn't have to get up. The second mistake Isaac made is moving around too much on the acupuncture table while screaming for help. When you have needles all over your skin, don't put yourself at risk for falling off a table. Hitting the ground with needles on the surface layer of your skin can cause puncture wounds. Puncture wounds are not only painful, but they increase your risk of infection because they are hard to clean and provide a warm, moist place for bacteria to grow. If left untreated, the bacterial infection from these deep needle puncture wounds can spread to your bloodstream. Usually, your immune system can fight off these infections. But if the bacteria in your bloodstream is present long enough or in large enough numbers, or if you have a weakened immune system, then it can travel and accumulate in organs in areas all over your body to cause infections and inflammation. This can cause meningitis, which is an inflammation of the fluids and membranes surrounding your brain and spinal cord, or pericarditis, which is an inflammation of the sac surrounding the heart. I can spend all day listing the potentially life-threatening bacterial infections, but I'll stop there. The remaining survivors are at the Chinese spa after getting the bad news about Isaac dying. Sam sees William for the third time and finally confronts this mysterious man about who he is. William reveals that he is a coroner and that he's seen this exact situation before, where a lucky few survivors of a disaster then die one by one. He says they created a wrinkle in reality, they were supposed to die on that bridge, they cheated death, and death is coming to collect their remaining lifespans. To escape death, they must kill someone who was never meant to die on that bridge. So essentially, they are exchanging the destined remaining lifespan of whoever they kill with their own lifespan, which should be zero. The question is, are you willing to kill someone to save your own life? Personally, I could not do it, but for the people who who could, I've got some good news for you. One in three murders in America go completely unresolved, with the police never even identifying a suspect or making an arrest. Also, the ideal target is going to vary by age, race, gender, and socioeconomic status. Obviously, a baby has more remaining lifespan to live before old age and health issues catch up to them versus an adult. In the United States, Asian Americans have the highest average life expectancy of 86.67 years. Hispanic Americans come in second place at 82.89 years years. White Americans are in third place at 79.12 years, and African Americans come in fourth place at 75.54 years. Life expectancy varies by gender, with women living longer than men on average. Life expectancy varies by socioeconomic status, with people of higher socioeconomic status living longer on average. So statistically, the ideal target would be an upper middle class Asian American female baby. Another survivor named Olivia is at an eye surgery clinic. The doctor that is about to give Olivia later laser eye surgery leaves the room to talk to his assistant. The eye laser machine turns on by itself, and the power level turns up to the maximum. The eye laser unexpectedly starts and is burning Olivia's eye. Olivia screams and struggles to free herself from the doctor's chair that uses a device to lock her head in place so she doesn't move it during the procedure, and an eyelid opening device that stops her from blinking. Sam and Molly show up at the eye clinic to warn Olivia about death trying to kill her. They hear Olivia screaming and run to her room. Olivia is finally able to free herself from the doctor's chair. A blinded Olivia trips and falls through a window to her death. Alright, let me explain how you can survive. The machines used during LASIK have eye tracking software, which move with the slightest movements that normally occur with a patient's eye. If the eyes move too much, however, the software will detect the excessive movement and shut off the laser until the patient recenters their gaze. So make sure you do not stop moving your eyes or center your gaze on the laser by rapidly focusing your eyes in different directions to cause the software to stop the procedure. Olivia made the mistake of keeping her gaze focused on the laser while she struggled to free her head from the doctor's chair and remove the eyelid opening device. Sam and Molly finally deduce that the survivors are dying in the order that they were meant to die on the bridge, so Nathan is next. Nathan and a disgruntled factory worker are having an argument. A malfunctioning mechanical hook falls on Nathan, but he gets out of the way at the last second. 
end, and the factory worker he was arguing with dies instead. So Nathan's life is officially off the chopping block. Even though it was an accident, he has technically killed someone to satisfy death. On a side note, Nathan even going back to work at the factory was really stupid, when he knew death was coming after him at some point. There's too much machinery, tools, and things that can go wrong inside a factory to be anywhere nearby when you are in this situation. Use your sick leave or quit your job to hide out in a motel room that does not have any kitchen appliances, like a stove, because they can malfunction to kill you. Use Uber Eats to get your food delivered so you don't have to leave the motel room. Unplug anything in the room that uses electricity. All you need is your smartphone. And when you're charging your smartphone, make sure to keep it far away from you, like inside the bathroom, to give yourself enough time to react, in case death uses that opportunity to cause a fire. Doing all this will buy you enough time to figure out who and how you're going to kill someone if you plan on sacrificing somebody else to death to save your own life. Dennis is another bridge survivor. Peter tries to tell Dennis that death is coming after the survivors, but Dennis just thinks Peter is stressed out and acting crazy. The main characters meet up with Nathan at the factory to discuss what happened with the worker that just died. Dennis arrives to ask questions about the incident. A falling wrench is launched through Dennis's head by a belt sander. Let me explain how you can survive. Do not be a fool that enters a dangerous factory after receiving a credible warning from Peter when there's incredibly strong supporting evidence, such as Sam predicting a bridge collapse and the survivors dying one by one in weird accidents. Sam makes the incredibly stupid and dangerous decision to go to his second job as a restaurant chef because he doesn't want to live the remainder of his life ruled by fear. Sam survives through the workday, and his manager allows him to set up a romantic dinner for just him and Molly after the restaurant closes. Peter shows up at the restaurant. Peter pulls out a gun and wants to kill Molly to claim her lifespan. He's gone crazy and is resentful that she was the only one among them destined to survive the bridge collapse. Sam and Molly run away from Peter. Jim, the FBI agent from the beginning of the movie, bugged the restaurant, hears everything going on inside, and calls for backup. Peter knocks Sam unconscious by pistol whipping him. Peter searches the restaurant for Molly who was hiding. Jim entered the restaurant and is shot to death by Peter. Since Peter has killed someone, his life is officially off the chopping block, but now he needs to kill Molly and Sam to eliminate the witnesses. Sam ambushes Peter, knocks the gun out of his hand, and the two fight. Sam manages to kill Peter by stabbing him in the back with a meat spit. Sam's life is saved because he killed Peter, who already took himself off death's list by killing Jim the FBI agent. Sam and Molly board a plane to Paris. The plane crashes, killing Sam, Molly, and everyone else on board. Unfortunately for Sam and Molly, they boarded the Valier Airlines Flight 180 that was featured in Final Destination 1. That Final Destination movie revolved around a high school kid named Alex that had a vision of the airplane crashing, who only managed to save himself and a few of his classmates that were kicked off the flight. I feel bad for Sam and Molly, they went through all that difficulty to save themselves from death, only to accidentally board an airplane by random chance, which was destined to crash. Nathan is told some bad news by a co-worker at the memorial service for Roy, who is the factory worker that Nathan accidentally killed. The bad news is that an autopsy was done on Roy for insurance purposes, and it turns out that he had a brain aneurysm that was going to kill him in a couple days. So Nathan only bought himself a few days of life by killing a man that was going to die very soon anyways. The plane Molly and Sam were on crashes into the memorial service and Nathan is killed instantly. This death could have been avoided if Nathan was strategic about the target he chose to sacrifice to death like I explained earlier. And that's the end of the movie, but what do you think? What would you do differently if you were one of the characters? Let me know with a comment down below, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more of these kinds of videos. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe if you liked the video. Until next time, have a great day.